So the expression which I have written on my screen here is commonly referred to as a whore triple. Um, and basically, it consists of a precondition, often denoted as P, a statement or a program, often denoted as S, and a postcondition, often denoted as Q. And you'll always see it with these uh, curly braces around the pre and postcondition. And the statement or program usually manifests as some kind of assignment statement. Um, for example, you might have P, and then you might have, that was terrible, you might have X mapped to E and then Q. So you might see something like this. This is a common way that um, you might find a Hoar triple in um, some common problems. Basically, X mapped to E is some kind of assignment statement. So you have some um, E in your initial in your initial state and in Q that, uh, that is mapped to X. And we'll see more examples of that, but basically the value of E in the initial state should be the same as the value of X in the final state. So the way that this basically works is that you'll have some um, precondition, which is basically the condition that needs to be satisfied in order for execution of S to guarantee that it will terminate in a state where the post condition is satisfied. So the way that you would read out um, a whore triple in English would be to say that the execution of S beginning in a state where P is satisfied will terminate in a state where Q is satisfied. And all that means is if we're starting in a state where this thing is true, and then we do this to this thing, we're going to end in a state where this thing is true. And we're going to take a look at some examples to hopefully make it more clear. So let's take a look at this whore triple given on the left here. So let's try to identify P, Q, and S. So in this case, given our standard notation where we have it looking something like this, we can take a look at this and we can identify that our precondition is x equals zero. And what that means is that this is the condition that needs to be satisfied in the state where we begin to execute our program. And that leads us to the next point. The program s is going to be x mapped to x plus one. So this is an assignment statement. And that's often how you'll see it in these types of problems. And then finally, we have our post condition x greater than zero. So this is the state that it will terminate in if we were to execute this beginning in this state. So how can we check the validity of a Hoare triple? How can we take a look at something like this and determine whether or not it is a valid set of a program, a precondition, and a post condition? Your intuition might say, well, let's take the precondition and let's apply the program to it and see if we get the post condition. But this is actually not the case. In reality, we take the, the assignment statement and the post condition and we apply the assignment statement to the post condition and we check if we get something that satisfies the precondition. In other words, a valid way to identify um, a valid precondition for a Hoare triple is to take a look at the post condition, R, and then perform the assignment statement on that post condition by mapping X to E. So if we were to take a look at this here and we wanted to check its validity, we have X equals zero, X mapped to X plus one, and X greater than zero. So if we were to take a look at this, um, we know that this is our post condition and this is our assignment statement. Let's ignore the precondition for a minute and let's just work with these two in order to check if our or triple is valid. So based on this rule here, we want to take the post condition R, which is going to be X greater than zero and perform the substitution that is specified in our program S. So if you recall textual substitution, this is gonna come down to X greater than zero. And we're gonna write it with this notation here because it's a textual substitution that we're performing in order to execute this assignment. And what this means is we're going to take all occurrences of x in our um, expression, and we're going to replace them with x plus 1. So this becomes x plus 1 greater than 0. We've taken our only occurrence of x. We've replaced it with x plus 1. And if we were to rearrange this a bit, we get x greater than negative 1. So this is what we get from evaluating r with x mapped to e. That's the result that we get from this. So let's take a look at this and see if it satisfies our given precondition. So the precondition we're given is that x equals zero. And here we see that we have ended up with x greater than negative one. 
We can choose x equals 0, and it satisfies, or it works with this. If x has to be greater than negative 1, x equals 0 is a possible answer that satisfies this condition, which means that this is a valid precondition. And you may have noticed we arbitrarily basically chose x equals 0 in order to check whether or not this specific precondition was satisfied. But there are other preconditions that will work with this whore triple and produce a valid um, a valid triple. And namely, all of those preconditions would basically be anything that satisfies x greater than negative 1. So if we had the precondition x equals 1, it would also satisfy x greater than negative 1. If we had the precondition x equals 6, it would also satisfy x greater than negative 1. If we had the precondition x greater than 5, it would also satisfy x greater than negative 1. Anything that satisfies this expression here is going to work as a valid precondition to the Hoare triple. And there are always, or in, in a lot of cases, not always, there are usually multiple preconditions that will satisfy a Hoare triple using a given um, assignment statement and post condition. So the question that a lot of people have then is, why is this the case? Why do we choose to take the post condition and then perform the assignment statement on the post condition instead of starting with the precondition and calculating the post condition that way? Why is it that we calculate the precondition from the post condition? So I'll explain that a bit now. All right, so let's take a look at this example here. So we can identify that this is our precondition. This is our program or our assignment uh, or a statement. And this is our post condition. So we're going to take our precondition, we execute the assignment, and then we end in a state where our postcondition is satisfied. So breaking this down, it's important to note that in this state, we have not yet, we have not yet performed S. And in this state, we have performed S. So that changes the way that um, we treat the variable X in either state. It's important to note that recall our definition for um, for a valid Hoare triple where we said we're going to have R with X map to E, and then we'll have X map to E and R. So this is featuring R with X map to E and R. And the important thing to see here is that these two are actually pretty much, well, not pretty much, they are the same statement, except Wherever this one has an occurrence of E, this one has an occurrence of X. Because they're the same thing, this one just has taken every occurrence of X and switched it for E. So going back to this idea here, where we haven't performed the assignment yet in the initial state, and we have performed the assignment in the final state, let's take a look at the way that this would progress. So we have X plus 1 greater than 5. So this is our initial state where this is satisfied. X is simply just X. It's only itself. It's not storing anything. It's not holding anything. It is honestly just itself. Then we're going to say, OK, we're going to uh, perform this assignment where we we take, we take catch this value of E. So our assignment statement here, when we look at this, it's telling us. you know, We know this is X map to E. It's telling us that E is X plus 1. And it's saying we caught this value of E from the initial state. We're capturing this E from the initial state, and we are hiding it inside X. So you're going to catch this value of E from the initial state. You're going to store it in X. So now X is holding on to this value of E. In this state, X is just X. It's not holding anything. No assignments have been performed yet. As soon as we execute this part, X is holding on to that value X plus 1, and it's hiding it. And then we end up in our post condition, X greater than 5. The reason that this is satisfied is because this X, it's not just X. It's not only itself. It's actually holding on to that value of E that we just assigned it. It's hiding that value of E. So you can kind of see now how it doesn't really make sense to take a look at this precondition and say, well, OK, I have x plus 1 greater than 5. And in the future, I'm going to perform this substitution of x equals x plus 1. So in order to check this, why don't I substitute this back into here and see if that works? It doesn't make any sense because in this case, x is just x. It's not holding on to anything. It's not holding on to an x plus 1 yet because this hasn't happened yet. So that's why it doesn't make sense to perform the assignment on the precondition in order to calculate the postcondition. What does make sense and the way that people actually do it is we're going to take our postcondition. We're going to say x greater than 5. 
This is our post condition. And we know that by the time we've reached our post condition, we're in our final state. That means the assignment has already been performed. It means we have already done x map to x plus 1. It means x is already hiding this value of x plus 1. So the way that we can expose this x plus 1 in order to back calculate our precondition is we're going to perform that textual substitution. So we can say x greater than 5, and we're going to perform that textual substitution of x with x plus 1. And that's because we know this x is hiding something. We know this x is holding on to that value of x plus 1 because when we saw the assignment statement, x map to x plus 1, we know that we're saying, OK, this is going to be hiding this expression in x. So this statement, it's, it's causing x to hold on to that expression. And in order to expose it, we're going to perform this substitution on the post condition because that's the state where x is holding on to that value. So if we perform that substitution, we're going to get x plus 1 greater than 5. And then if we do some rearranging, we can get x greater than 5 minus 1, which is going to result in x greater than 4. And if you wanted to leave it in this state, actually, that's the way that it shows up in the precondition here. You can see that this satisfies our precondition. So this is a valid Hoare triple. And in general, if you wanted to calculate a precondition and you were given a statement and a postcondition, you could do it by this method. Because as soon as you see a statement and a postcondition, completely ignoring the precondition, as soon as you see this part, the the statement and the post condition, you can take a look at it and say, well, OK, it's giving us like this thing right here. This has to be E. And it's saying, OK, supposedly it caught this E from the initial state and it held onto it and it stored it in X. So if that's the case, then surely when I take my um, my X from my post post condition, so if I take X in my final state and I swap it out for E, I swap it out for E then surely it's going to result in something that would have been true back here because we caught our, our E, we stored it in X. So if I expose that E, I should get my precondition back. And that's basically the thought process behind this. So it's good to look at it in the way that it logically progresses. You're going to start in this precondition. You're going to catch that E. You're going to hold on to it. You're going to hide it in X. So back here, X is just X. It's only itself. As soon as you perform this, now X is holding on to X plus 1. And in here, this X is kind of lying. It's kind of hiding in X plus 1, which is why you perform the textual substitution in this part, because you want to expose what that X is hiding. And you don't do it over here, because over here, X isn't hiding anything. So to end this off, let's do an example of an invalid Hoare triple. So taking a look at this, we can first identify all of the pieces. So we know that this is our precondition. This is our statement or assignment or um, program. And this is our postcondition. So we've identified the different constituent parts of our Hoare triple. Now we can get to checking whether or not it's valid. So the way that we just learned that we can do a validity check is that we can take these two parts, we can take our assignment and our post condition, and we can perform this substitution on here to check if we get back our precondition or if we end up in a state where the precondition is satisfied. And again, this is because as soon as, you know, when we're over here, this x, it's just x, it's not hiding anything. As soon as we perform this part, now this x is hiding x plus 1. And so over here, this x isn't really x, it's hiding that value of x plus 1. So if we were to perform the textual substitution, we've got x equals 8, and we're going to say x is being switched out for x plus 1. So now, based on textual substitution rules, this means we're going to take every occurrence of x, and we're going to replace it with x plus 1. So let's do that. So we've got one occurrence of x over here. We're going to replace it with x plus 1. We get x plus 1 equals 8. All right, so now we can do some rearranging, and we end up with x equals 8 minus 1, which means that x equals 7. Now, looking at our precondition, we can see that this did not end in a state where the precondition was satisfied. The state in which x equals 7 is not the same as the state in which x equals 6. And the condition that x equals 7 means that you cannot possibly satisfy the condition that x equals 6. So our Hoare triple is not valid because when we perform the textual substitution, as per the rule for checking validity, we did not end in a state where the precondition was satisfied.